Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Rotary Club of Gainesville Tuesday meeting at the Cade Museum. Please remember to silence your cell phones, and if you're watching this after the fact on YouTube, please register your participation by sending an email to info at rotary.org. Uh, up first for song and pledge, Tom Collette. Thanks, everybody. Let's do God Bless America. Are you ready, Gordon? God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with foam. God bless America, my home sweet home. God bless America, my home sweet home. It's nice to have Lori and Brendan egging me on to finish that way. Thank you. <laughs> Let's pledge allegiance to our flag. Are you ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Tom. And for our invocation today, Ernie Hall. Thank you not deserved, I promise you, it's not deserved. <laughs> I'm the joke of the day. <laughs> no. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that you fill in us this day your vision. Guide us to live by our vision, working to build a beloved community where everyone is welcome, all are valued, and all your children have the opportunities to succeed and know wholeness and well-being. Bless this meeting today as we strive to serve you. Bless the food that's been prepared for the nourishment of our bodies. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ernie. We invite our guests and visiting Rotarians to please remain standing. Good afternoon, everybody. We have a new guest who's a former Rotarian from Ponta Vedra Beach. Did I get that right? Okay, excellent. And she is the commercial market manager at PNC Bank. Just bought about 45 acres down south of our town and is looking to be a new member. So please welcome Jessica Evans. Good afternoon, Rotarians. I've got a guest here today, John Rodier, who's a local marketing expert, runs uh, his own marketing company, and is interested in joining us here at Rotary. This is his second guest meeting today. So please thank John for joining us. All right, thank you both for visiting us today. Up now, we have a very special craft talk from Dan Boyd. Thank you for permitting me to give a craft talk, the craft talk that I tried to give 49 years ago <clears throat> when I first joined this club. I told them that I was a Jacksonville native, that I graduated from Landon High School in 1959, enrolled at the University of Florida and graduated in 1963. I got a teaching job in Alachua County at Waldo in 1964. And um, in 1968, I was the assistant principal of Santa Fe High School after having achieved my master's degree uh, from the University of Florida. I was offered a position as the principal of Chiefland High School in 1969 and left Alachua County. 
I thought I would probably make a career somewhere else. Uh, after a year at Chiefland, I got a call from Tiny Talbot, the superintendent, and he said, come back and take Howard Bishop Junior High School, which I did. And the next year, 53 years ago, Tiny sent me to Gainesville High School. And I stayed there for 24 years, and it was one of the most wonderful experiences that an individual could have. I inherited a veteran faculty, um, many of whom were veterans of the Second World War. They were competent, and I used them intensively to give me advice and to help me administer Gainesville High School. And um, our intent was always to put the students first, to set them up for academic success so they could achieve whatever their goals and ambitions were. And looking back on it, I know how fortunate I was to have had several superintendents who continued me at Gainesville High School. 24 years is an unusual amount of time for a principal to spend in a school. And I was very fortunate to have had that opportunity to do. I retired as a member of the Alachua County staff in 1999 and went to work under Robert W. Hughes, a Rotarian and former superintendent, um, as the associate commissioner of the Florida High School Athletic Association. And I thought that was where I would spend the rest of my time. Uh, little did I know in 2004, the superintendent asked me to apply for the superintendent's position, which I did. I was the only candidate they had, so I figured I had a pretty good chance of maybe <laughs> getting an interview, at least. But I was hired and uh, started on the 1st of July in 2004 and stayed until the 1st of October in 2013. And it was a wonderful experience to be able to follow in my father's footsteps. He had been superintendent of Duval County in Jacksonville for 12 years, and it was a dream come true. And I thank the school board. I'm humbled by the opportunity I had to serve, and it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. I became a Rotarian in 1975 as an invitation from C. Lee Eggert, who was a professor of educational administration at the University of Florida. Um, I joined the club. I've been a constant member for 49 years, and uh, it was one of the best decisions I made. Lee told me, he said, Danny, I want you to join the club. It will introduce you to the heartbeat of Gainesville. And he, it, was, it was true. He did. I thank all of you for the many courtesies that you have extended to me over the years. And uh, I thank you for your friendship. And I love the Rotary Club. And uh, thank you for this privilege to introduce myself once again. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for that. I really uh, appreciate that, and I really like that quote, the heartbeat of Gainesville. Good afternoon, Rotarians. I'm John Thomas. I'm standing in for President Ryan. He's a, a little bit under the weather today, but thank you guys for coming. And if I could have Guy Joplin join me up here, he's going to introduce today's speaker. Good morning or afternoon, fellow Rotarians. It is my great pleasure today to introduce one of our very own to present to us today. Uh, Amber Miller serves as the president and CEO of the United Way of North Central Florida, a role she has embraced since 2021, following her effective leadership as interim CEO during the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Since joining the organization in 2018, Amber has leveraged her extensive background in marketing, advertising, community relations, and nonprofit development, leading the organization through a post-pandemic transformation. 
Her unwavering commitment to helping others is complemented by her ability to devise innovative solutions through collaborative efforts. Beyond her responsibilities at the United Way, Amber actively participates on the Board of Directors of the United Way of Florida, where she contributes to both a statewide public policy committee and the strategic planning committee. Additionally, she serves on the Board of Directors of Rotary Club of Gainesville. Having been a dedicated member since 2017, in her personal life, Amber enjoys reading and cherishing moments with her husband, young son, and three beloved pets. So please join me in welcoming our very own Amber Miller. Hey, I'm, I'm gonna try to be really good and stand right here because I, I usually like to walk around and move. So this is new for me to not be mobile. All right, so today I'm gonna talk to you about United Way of North Central Florida in a way that I don't think I've, I've done for this club before. Um, I want to reintroduce you to our organization and who we are and what we do because as Guy mentioned in my bio, we are undergoing transformation in our organization and I'm so excited about it. Um, so I just wanna share a little bit with you guys today. So what does United Way of North Central Florida do? What is our promise to our community? And, and our promise is that we are gonna mobilize communities to action so that everyone can thrive. Okay, where do we work? We cover six counties. We have Alachua, Bradford, Dixie, Gilchrist, Levy, and Union. So although we are based out of Gainesville, um, we cover a pretty significant region. And we are one of just a, a handful of United Ways that cover multiple counties like this across the state. So we have a pretty big footprint and the important thing is, is that everything that we raise within our six counties stays in our six counties. So when we do fundraising and things like that, those dollars stay here to, to impact our community. They never leave our, our community um, unless the donor indicates they want those dollars to go to a specific organization. But otherwise, everything that we do here is to the benefit of the individuals that live in North Central Florida. So I always like to plug that because Although we're part of a national, international network of United Ways, um, we actually pay membership dues to United Way Worldwide to be able to operate as United Way and have the logo and the colors and all those fun things. But the impact is local. This is, we are your United Way. We belong to those six counties. So what do we do? So this is part of our transformation. Many of you have known us as focusing in health, education, and financial stability, but we now have four expanded pillars of focus for United Way of North Central Florida. We have healthy community, youth opportunity, financial security, and community resilience. Community resiliency is a new pillar for us, and I'm excited that it, it is a pillar now because we have done a lot of work in the space of community resiliency in the past, but didn't quite get the recognition. Um, we are, I like to say we are the pipeline to the front line. So we have a lot of first responding organizations that are there boots on the ground when we have a disaster. And we are oftentimes behind the scenes, recruiting volunteers, uh, fundraising, getting the dollars into the community and then allocating the dollars back out. So we're back there and so I'm very excited about the community resiliency piece. And the photo that you see is actually from last year from a food distribution and supply distribution that we did out in Dixie County after Hurricane Adelia hit. So these are actually two residents of uh, Dixie County. They came out and spent the day with us in the heat and it was a very rewarding experience. So why do we do what we do? Um, last year, our board underwent some strategic discussions about how do we want to impact our community going forward. We experienced so much during the pandemic and coming out of that, our community has changed. The needs have changed. And so we really wanted to take a deep dive and see what was going on and who was being impacted, which led to the creation of what we call the Alice Funnel. Um, Alice is a report that we have been uh, participating in for over a decade. It is a, a study of individuals that live in counties and, in, and within our entire state and their income, their household makeup, basic needs, 
how much money should they be making in order to afford their basic needs. And so this funnel here shows you the breakdown of those households. So for Alachua County, when we look at the population and then we break it down into households, we have about you know 49% that are doing really good. Uh, they're above the Alice threshold so they can afford their basic needs. But if you look in the light blue and in the orange pieces of the funnel, those are where those households are starting to struggle and are struggling. So the light blue is what we refer to as our Alice households. These are households who are working, but they still can't afford to make ends meet. And then in the orange, those are the households that meet the federal poverty level. So they are down there and they are getting assistance, um, but they are still kind of stuck. And so when we created that first part of the funnel, um, I thought, you know, let's add in another piece of the puzzle here. So it doesn't quite add up to 100% because the Alice report does not take into account individuals who are experiencing homelessness. And so at the time, we were still the lead agency for the homeless continuum of care, so we had data. So I pulled the data to see who we had counted. Now we know it was 644 individuals this past January. We know that's not everyone. There are more people who are homeless that are couch surfing, so this isn't the number. Um, but when we looked at that, and we saw the percentage who are homeless and the percentage that are below the Alice threshold, our board knew at that time we need to make a change in what we're doing and what our focus is because if we do not help these individuals who are in the light blue and the orange, they are going to fall down into the red and we are going to have a huge problem in our community. And so we have made that shift and are focusing all of our efforts on the Alice population and those who are in poverty because we want to help lift them up. So who is Alice? Alice is an acronym for Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. And as I mentioned, these are individuals who are working but still can't afford to make ends meet. And what the Alice report does, which is very unique in my opinion, is it takes into consideration the cost of living where you're living. Whereas the federal poverty level is a national standard. It doesn't change. So the FPL for Los Angeles is the same as it is here, and that doesn't really help us. Uh, so the Alice report looks at, again, where you are living, what the costs are there, what the median income is there for specific jobs, and then it calculates, you know, what would a family of four with two adults working and a child in school and a child needing childcare, what do they need to make in order to pay their uh, mortgage or their rent, their utilities, their transportation, their health care, their child care. Uh, they have to have technology now, because if you don't have internet access, you are cut off from so many other things. You can't even apply for most jobs now without going online and filling out an application. So Alice across our six counties fluctuates. Here in Alachua County, we're at about 51% of households that fall below the Alice threshold. So what does that mean? The 51% includes those households who are Alice and those who are in poverty. So over half of our population uh, here. And then you can see the other five counties that we cover. We've got Dixie at 64% of all of their households are falling below that threshold. So, you know, imagine you're in the car driving down the street and you're in traffic, you know, on Newberry Road, half the cars around you are probably thinking about how am I going to pay this bill? How am I going to pay that bill? I'm going to be late picking up my kid because I'm stuck in traffic and the child care center is going to charge me $10 a minute every minute that I'm late. Those kinds of situations are we're finding our families in. Um, these are just some of the headlines that I pulled within the last couple of months. We actually, at the beginning of the year, had a feature in Florida Trend Magazine. They did a, a three-part series, so if you get that, uh, the articles are in there. You can also look them up online. They looked at it, Alice, across the state of Florida. Um, very impactful articles. But um, one of the ones that really grabbed me was there was an individual on TikTok that had talked about you know, how they could not afford to make their ends meet, and they wanted an explanation in crayon eating terms. And this is stuff that we hear every single day. We're getting calls every day from really hardworking people that just can't 
figure it out. They can't get help because they make too much money. And there are no services out there for those individuals that make too much money. And so that's what we're working to change right now. So here's a look at Alice over time in Alachua County. If you look at the light blue line, those are our Alice households. And then those that are in the darker blue are those households that meet the federal poverty level or are below it. So as you can see, it's kind of ebbed and flowed over the years. This data is from 2022. That's our most recent report. So the 2024 Alice report reflects 2022 data. And there's always a two-year lag because it takes time to collect the data, to analyze the data, create the report. So um, our, what we're projecting is that Alice is going to continue to rise and that Alice um, and those in poverty are going to continue to rise. There's a lot going on right now. Um, you have inflation, you have extreme rent. Um, there's just, it, there's so much impacting these families and childcare now is at a level that is equivalent to someone's rent and mortgage payment. And it's just, we're at this point where how do we solve this? You know, we got to drill down to the root cause because what we're seeing is there are so many nonprofits out there triaging, right? If we look at this, like you're in a hospital, you know, and you're triaging, you've got the food bank that's trying to dish food out as much as possible. You've got, you know, individuals trying to do quick housing solutions or uh, paying utility bills to keep people where they are, but but we need to drill down a little bit deeper. And so that's where we come in uh, as an organization is trying to figure out what is that root cause? Do we just need more financial education? Do we need to have programs and supports in place for those Alice households to do a one-time preventative um, financial assistance that keeps them in their home and then maybe they can get right back on their feet? So those are the things that we're looking at from our organization. I'm going to try to play this video, maybe. I might need you to click it, Brendan. People are struggling isn't just a problem for them, it's a problem for all of us because there's so much that's lost when young people can't succeed, when families can't meet their needs or, or have stability, and when communities aren't thriving places. So there's a tremendous amount at stake. It's so important that United Way has taken up this cause. They have created an acronym that humanizes people who are struggling financially in this country. We now have a name, Alice, which really matters, that it's not about data and percentages, but a, a person, real people who are trying to make ends meet. That's why I'm glad United Way is doing this and why the Annie E. Casey Foundation is proud to partner with them in trying to get the word out. So we are working on kind of a national movement. Uh, United Ways across the country are banding together behind Alice and this research and this data, but also behind the people and asking, you know, for corporations, large and small, for our nonprofits, for everyone to kind of come together and recognize, hey, we have a problem here and we need to figure out some solutions to this because we do have a, a lot of people that are experiencing these difficulties and so we need to kind of figure this out i'm hoping i can get it to go yay <laughs> all right so accomplishments year to date this is just as of january of this year but here's what we've been working on we've um over almost two million dollars returned to our taxpayers through our vita program so for those who aren't familiar vita is our volunteer income tax assistance program. We offer this every tax season and we do free tax returns. We target our low to moderate income families. So if we can do their taxes for them and save them those tax prep fees and then help them get their earned income tax credits and child tax credits, we want to make sure we can put money back in their pockets. And a lot of times these families are depending on those dollars uh, to help with their rent and to pay back bills, and things like that. So Vita is great. We love it. We do it in all six counties. There's a flyer on your table. If you have family or friends or staff you want to share it with, they can call 211 in January and schedule an appointment and we'll do their taxes for them. We've also provided over $39,000 in emergency assistance to 30 Alice households. 
So again, these are those households that don't qualify for government programs because they make too much money. And so we're able to help them with either a rent or mortgage payment. Sometimes it's a, a utility payment. Sometimes it's first, last, and security. But if they've, they've got to have um, income of some sort, so we know that once we pay that bill, they can continue to maintain moving forward. And if they find, we find them in a situation where they can't, then we work with our agency partners to plug them into a program where they can get some financial literacy courses and potentially a case manager that can really handhold them through the process. We've uh, provided almost $14,000 in post-disaster uh, assistance. So we had Hurricane Adelia last year, we had Hurricane Debbie uh, last month, and so we are getting phone calls from individuals that need assistance. We are also the fiscal agent for the long-term recovery group in the Tri-County area that covers Dixie, Gilchrist, and Levy County. And because we assumed that role, the state of Florida awarded us with $50,000 to be able to do some recovery, long-term recovery work in those areas. And we had a meeting yesterday and we were able to allocate some funds to some households that were really struggling. We had uh, a household as two elderly individuals. Their home was completely destroyed by Hurricane Adelia. And they qualified for the SHIP program to get their home rebuilt. And all the permits have gone through and they're kind of on the cusp of getting started on their home. They're, they've been living in a FEMA trailer and uh, their only barrier was they had to have the seawall repaired before they could get the work on the house started. And because we received that money from the state, we were able to, within the group, review their case and approve to go ahead and pay this to have the seawall repaired so that they can get their house back. So very, very cool to be a part of that. And then with Reading Pals, uh, from last January through the end of summer, we had about 165 students come through that. Reading Pals is our early childhood literacy program where we're partnering volunteers with students who are reading below grade level. And so this is a really great program that we do. We have volunteers meet with the kids at least once a week for an hour after school. We do lots of literacy and phonics activities with them. The goal is to get them reading on grade level um, by the end of the school year. And we just launched a new VPK site in collaboration with Gainesville for All. So they just opened last week. So it's pretty cute to see these little VPK students getting on their reading on. 211, that's our 24 seven resource referral line. This is something that we have um, funded and provided to our community. Uh, this is, like I said, 24 seven coverage, 365 days a year. So when you or someone you know is having a hard time and they need some help and they're not sure who to turn to, they can call 211 and get connected to one of our, our professional counselors. They are all certified. They can do uh, interventions, suicide interventions if necessary, um, because you never know who's gonna call and when you start talking to them about their problems, they may not have had those thoughts when they first got on the call, but then as the call progresses, they may. So we wanna make sure that the people that are answering those phone lines can work with that individual if that situation escalates. You don't wanna just transfer someone to a different line in hopes that the call gets connected. So we wanna have that continuity there. Um, but what you'll see is in the orange, the light orange color, that's our fiscal year for July 1st of 2023 through June 30th of 2024. And we had 11,521 calls come in. Um, for the month of July, we had 937. And then below that, those are the number of needs. So if you look at the fiscal year to date, that 11,500, that's the number of callers, but when they call, they typically need more than one thing. And so out of those 11,000 callers, they needed over 25,000 different needs met. And then below that, you'll see that, I think it's 22,707. Those are the referrals that were made. So if you're calling and you need food and you also need help with rent and utilities and you also need help with childcare, oh, and you're a veteran and you need veteran services and this, we're gonna look, give you connections to address every single one of those needs. And then when you look at the bottom, this is the trends of what we saw. So for the fiscal year, it was utilities and rent and connections to government community services. And then for the month of July, it was utilities, mental health, and food. So we get these reports every month and we look at them and that allows us to kind of see 
where's our community at right now? What are the needs? And we know what zip code is coming from and um, we can kind of drill down and see what services are there. Maybe there's a gap. How can we address that gap? This is a really long testimonial <laughs> and I can't read it from here, but I'll summarize. But we had a gentleman call us, his name's Corey Wise, and he was struggling to pay some of his bills. He had gotten ill and um, gotten some, hosp uh, some hospital bills and he couldn't work. And this is a gentleman who's doing all the right things. Very first person in his family to go to college was just trying to do everything that he could the right way. And because he got sick, he fell behind on these bills and now he's in trouble and he doesn't know what to do and his family can't help him. And he was able to, we were able to work with him and get him caught up on his bills. And so when we asked him if he wouldn't mind uh, writing his, a testimonial, he was so cute because he, uh, he got into law school. So we were very excited about that. So I kind of told the team, I was like, look, we, we made a lawyer. So, <laughs> um, but it's really cool to be able to help people because a lot of times it's just one time. And for some of us, we do have family that supports us or we have really strong friendships and we can go to those people if we need to borrow money or we need a little, little help. But there's a lot of people that don't have those relationships and we're the only answer for them. So it's a privilege to be able to be in a position where we can help those who need us. So how do we do all of this? Um, these are pictures of some of our awesome uh, donors and supporters. We fundraise year round, primarily with workplaces. So we do payroll deduction campaigns. And then we also have Small Business United, which is a program where small businesses can donate back on a monthly basis. We also have individual donors. Uh, we also have some amazing, incredible volunteers. You'll see the one photo with Santa in there. Uh, we had took a team out and I believe that was nationwide. Um, and we took them to Project Youth Build to do the food distribution. So we try to help out however we can. Sometimes it's through funding. Sometimes it's through amassing volunteers. Sometimes it's just getting the right people at the table to have a conversation about solutions. And that is what we're here for. This is just uh, the QR code for the Alice report. I've put a copy on everyone's table, but if you're curious and you want to read it uh, on your own, you can scan that and look at it. We also have them by counties. There's also a really incredible uh, database at United for Alice um, slash Florida, where you can go in and actually play with the numbers. And there's a, a calculator on there, so you can put in your household, how many adults, how many kids, uh, what your hourly wage is, and it'll calculate and tell you whether or not you're at the Alice threshold or if you're above, and there's just all kinds of things you can do on there. You can also look at some, some maps and see where resources are and where things are missing. And part of our transformation is we're getting a brand refresh. So we're having a ribbon cutting on Wednesday, October 23rd from 1130 to 1 at our office. We would love to invite everybody to come and just meet our team and see our, our brand refresh and get connected. It'll be a, a fun day. We're doing that in collaboration with the Chamber of Commerce, who are great partners with us too. So, and that's it. I really enjoyed your presentation. I'm wondering, do you work with, with older children other than K3 through the families? We have, um, and it's something we want to expand into more because there is a gap there. Reading Pals right now is um, a program that we've been doing that's funded by a specific grant, and they specify that we do pre-K through third grade. So that's kind of why we are a lim little limited now, but we do see the need. Amber, share with them how old United, this uh, community is. The United Way, mm -hmm. that was started in 1957. So Do you remember what I had sent you? Yes, you yes. did. Your husband helped start that United Way. One of our Rotary members. Mm -hmm. Yep. Could you tell me how our United Way area compares with the rest of Florida? I mean, I guess all United Ways are doing the Alice thing? Um, you know, I, I, cause Alice is done by county. So every county is different. 
But you can do the comparison if you go to the Alice dashboard, the online dashboard that we have. You can pull up and compare two counties side by side. So if you wanted to, if you were curious to see how Alachua was doing compared to Miami Dade, you could totally do that on there. But I don't know offhand. Amber, thank you so much. I have more common than question, mm -hmm. but he said I could only have one question. Jason said that. <laughs> but the comment is how you help nonprofit. Really appreciate when you help me and some of the things that for my own nonprofit. So mm -hmm. if I ever grow up in nonprofit, I want you. Oh. <laughs> uh, the way you run non, um, the United Way. But my question is regard to sustainability. Mm -hmm. And this may be uh, the challenge with nonprofit in general where the pockets could go so deep. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep it sustaining the organization, especially when you hear the incredible, amazing testimonial or somebody mm -hmm. coming to you, I need help. But unfortunately, sometimes you don't need that you don't get that money right away. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? And to, in the aspect of turning, somebody said, I'm very sorry, we could not help. So how do you keep the sustainability of the organization? Yeah. So that's, it's a, that's a hard question uh, to answer. Because, yeah, we, although you want to help everybody, depending on where the funding is coming from, sometimes that determines and sets limitations to what we can do. Um, so for example, one of our, our pots of funding that we get is from a, a, a donor, a large private donor, and they have guidelines that we have to follow to provide that assistance. So although it is for individuals who are working for those Alice families, the stipulation is that their, their issue has to have been within the last 90 days. Uh, they have to show that there's a loss of income. Uh, we can't use those funds to pay for a prescription. So if someone comes to me and they are come to me, you know, 98 days after, I can't help them with that, that pot of money. Um, but what we are trying to do is we have separate funds. We have our, our United We Care Fund, which we started in response to the pandemic, which we have transitioned to be a crisis fund that is more flexible and we can make those determinations on our own. And so what we do is we just review the cases, we look at the circumstance, we talk to the individual, we get the documentation to prove that the loss occurred, and then we also want to know that they are going to be sustainable after we make that investment in them because that's, that's our purpose for, for providing that help. We don't want to enable someone to continue um, kind of working the system, which you do get some of those individuals. But if we have someone like that, that's where we connect with our partners to say, you know what, this person needs, really needs more intensive case management, which is not something that we do right now. So we would then hand that person off and make the connection. Yep. What a wonderful organization that you have in the, the mission that you have. I wanted to ask further to the sustainability uh, <clears throat> would be on the environment, and that would be regarding, we, we know that buses are more efficient than automobiles and a heck of a lot less costly. Um, you also have a program in town for helping people with utilities as far as improving their performance of their home, mm -hmm. if they happen to be homeowners. Um, are you interfacing with any of that kind of work? We haven't yet, in terms of like funding, we haven't done any of that yet. Uh, in, for public policy, those are discussions that we're having at the state level uh, to determine what our legislative consensus agenda is gonna be this year. And so we do have some environmental issues on there because that it all ties together, as you know, but uh, we haven't done anything strongly at the local level. So I have a little bit of a testimonial. My daughter saw your flyer for the Reading Pals. She said, Dada, you should do that. She's 10 and loves to read. And so I did the first one last week, and it was fantastic. So I recommend it to everybody. It's one hour, and you're with a kid who's just thrilled that you're there. So I highly recommend it if anybody has any extra time. That is awesome. Oh, my gosh. I have to say hi to you, and I'm done. That's incredible. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Amber, quick question from Zoom. Mm -hmm. uh, Carlos asks, how much funding does United Way get from National? 
zero. <laughs> <laughs> that was easy. Yeah. We don't get any funding. from All of the money that we get is from our, our local donors. <laughs> in regard to funding mm -hmm. what is the current breakdown let's say business individual grants mm -hmm. what's kind of the breakdown where you get those pots of money if you will yeah so that has shifted for us um so when you'll when our annual report comes out for this past fiscal year which ended june 30th you'll see a lot from grants because we were still the lead agency for the homeless continuum of care. So we had a lot of federal grants that were coming to us that we were passing to other entities. Uh, but for this fiscal year, we it's very small. Majority of our fundraising comes from those workplace campaigns, the payroll deduction. That's where the bulk of it, of it comes from. And then we have um, a little over 100,000 that we get from just individual donors, uh, around 60,000 from small business. And then we do have, this year we'll probably have about 250,000 in grants. We still are writing some to, because we would like more, <laughs> but, um, but that's kind of where we are right now. And then in terms of our overall revenue, it's, it's kind of wonky because we have about a $1.2 million budget for our organization. And then we also are, um, the fiscal agent for the University of Florida's Campaign for Charities, which their dollars, we do all the back end work for them. So that's kind of on our books. So that's another, you know, 850 to 900,000. So when you look at our financials, you might say, oh, they got a lot of money. And it's like, no, it's all, it's designated. <laughs> I don't have a lot of loose change. I would like more, <laughs> but, um, but yeah. All right, thank you guys. Oh, thank you, Amber, for your time and for talking with us today and everything you do for the club. And as a token of our appreciation, we are going to make a donation to the Child Center for Early Learning. Uh, just a reminder, next week our speaker is going to be from our own club, Jacob Natim. He's going to be speaking about the Southern Sudan Healthcare Organization. The quote of the day, giving is the key to living a life of abundant blessings, Layla Akita. And the winning number for the drawing is 779. Seven, seven, nine, seven, seven, nine. All right, we got a winner. We are